Father in heaven, we want to thank you for all of these beautiful praises that we have heard. My heart rejoices to hear the testimonies from Logan and Alyssa and Amanda and others. Just thrilled, thrilled to hear what you are doing in the lives of people. Allie, what God, what you're doing in the life of her mother. And Father, that you found my camera. It's such a small, material thing. But, but Father, we are so thankful that, that you even know the numbers of hairs on our head. And you know the swallow that falls to the ground. None of this happens without your notice. And so, Father, it brings us joy to be aware of um, just how involved you are in our day-to-day -day lives. And Father, we want to be able to share that, both person to person, as we are doing in our outreach, but also in a public setting. And Father, there's not a doubt in my room that many in this, in this room are going to be called to preach um, in, in some uh, circumstances to large groups of people, large audiences. Father, you've called all of us to preach at some level, but some to really preach and so I just pray that, that this course here, this brief course on preaching, would not be complex, that it would not be overwhelming, but that it would bring the great biblical truth uh, to bear on our minds, and that is that preaching is truth through personality. And so teach us what preaching is and give us a passion for the Word of God proclaimed in a contemporary and contextual and compelling way. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so in talking about preaching, the very first thing I want to say is that fundamentally preaching is a very simple thing. Okay? Fundamentally preaching is a very simple thing. In fact, it almost feels a little weird for me to have a class on preaching, on how to preach, because the truth of the matter is, at least from my perspective, and I believe from a biblical perspective, is that Preaching is you being you for the glory of God. Okay, preaching is you being you for the glory of God and expositing or explaining or explicating something from the Word of God, something from the Bible. Now, let me sort of unpack that a little bit here. We often think of preaching as what takes place on Sabbath morning. By the way, that was a wonderful sermon yesterday morning, or two mornings ago, amen? Oh, the Spirit of God just spoke to me through that sermon. In fact, this morning for my devotions, I read Jeremiah 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, just so that I could see if the preacher had been true to the text. And man, it was really a blessing. In fact, I told Brian, and uh, because there's no copyright on the truth, I told him, I'm stealing that sermon. That sermon now officially belongs to me, just so you know. I will be preaching that. So the Spirit of God really spoke to me. But we often think of preaching as that. We think of preaching as involving a tie and involving a suit, and involving a pulpit, and involving a church, and involving pews, and then the preacher stands up to preach, okay? Now, that can be preaching, but that doesn't mean that that is what all preaching is. Does that make sense? So many of us have a very narrow view of preaching, okay? An apple is red, but not everything that's red is an apple. Standing up on Sabbath morning and, and doing what we do in the divine worship service, that is preaching, but that's not, that's not all that preaching is. Preaching is truth through personality. Preaching is truth through personality. So it feels a little weird for me to teach a class on preaching because I can't really teach Jan how to be Jan. Jan knows far more about being Jan to the glory of God than I do. Daniel knows far more about being Daniel to the glory of God than I do. Patricia knows far more about being Patricia to the glory of God than I do. I don't know anything about being Patricia or Jan or Daniel or any of you. Now, I, because of the uh, consensus of human experience, I probably can understand and relate to many of the things that we all are going through in here. But fundamentally, when you stand up to preach, you are able to make a contribution to the kingdom of God that no one else could make because you're a unique person. When you stand up to preach, you are able to make a contribution to the kingdom of God that no one else could make because you are a unique person. Does that make sense? So, so that's the first thing I just have to get across to you here is that you should not strive to be anyone other than yourself when you are preaching because preaching is simply truth through the conduit of personality. That being the case then, Chris's preaching will be fundamentally different from my preaching because Chris is fundamentally a different person than I am. His life experience, his perspective, uh, what has brought him to this place is, is fundamentally different than my experience, my perspective, and what has brought me to this place. And so when we take Bible truth and we funnel it through Chris, he brings his unique perspective. He brings his unique take. He brings his unique experience. And then when it funnels through Chris, his proclamation is fundamentally different. Does that make sense? It's fundamental. In fact, if you've ever heard two people preach similar sermons, the sermons, though similar, were not identical. 
The sermons, though similar, were not identical. In fact, we could give out a sermon. We could say, okay, rather than choosing your own sermon, we want everybody to preach this sermon. We could give you the rough layout of the sermon. And while there would be definite similarities in the sermons, nobody's sermon would be identical. Even if you were all preaching the same content because you're different people. Does that make sense? Now, you can see right away the significance of this then is that we should never try to preach like someone else. Right? We should never try to preach like someone else because what we would be doing then would be effectively robbing God of the unique contribution that we could make. Now, that does not mean that we cannot notice and observe stylistic things in someone's preaching that, that we like. Probably the reason that you like them is that they speak to you in a way that you like to be spoken to. How many of us have heard of the love languages? The five love languages, Gary Chapman? Okay, do we know what they are? Does anyone know them? Physical touch, words of affirmation, acts of service, quality time, and gifts. That's right, gifts. Okay, very good. So basically the thesis of the book is, is that you are going to give love. It's a great book, by the way. You are going to give love in a way very similar to the way that you would like to receive love. In other words, you're going to speak a certain kind of language. If for you the most important thing is quality time, then that's the kind of love that you're going to try to administer to your spouse or to your significant other, and that's going to be the best way for your spouse to communicate love to you, right? If you're not really big on gifts, my family's not a big gift family. I could buy my wife lots of gifts and lots of stuff, and th that wouldn't really communicate to her. She'd be happy, don't get me wrong. She'd be thankful. But the, the way that my wife really receives love is quality time. Like that, above everything else, it's just quality time. So here's the point on that. We often will give what we would best receive. So now for me, it's probably words of affirmation, physical touch, something like that. So it's very interesting. When I go to love my wife, I often try to love her in a way that is very consistent with the way that I would prefer to be loved, in the way that love would be communicated to me, i.e., words of affirmation, physical touch. And because quality time, yes, it's important to me, but it's not the most important, I have to be intentional about making that a priority, making quality time a priority. Does that make sense, everyone? So if you listen to someone preach and you're like, man, I like the way he does ABC, or I like the way that she did ABC, Probably the reason that you resonate with that is that it's the way that you like to be taught and would like to teach others. There's nothing wrong with that. I want to be clear about that. Nothing at all wrong with seeing elements of other people's proclamation that you personally resonate with. But do you see how that's very different than trying to be like someone else in their preaching and in their proclamation? Do we understand that, everyone? And, and the converse is also true. You might hear somebody preach and think, oh, I don't really... I don't like the way that he uses this uh, uh, structure for his sermons, or I don't like the way that he speaks too fast or too slow or tells so many stories. So we can be aware and evaluative of other people's proclamation, but at the, at the end of the day, you've got to be Tara, you've got to be D, you've got to be Henry, and I've got to be David. And I've got to be the best David Asherick that I can be to the glory of God, and ultimately David Asherick's preaching ministry will grow out of David Asherick as a person. Henry's preaching ministry will grow out of Henry's personhood. Making sense, everyone? So if you try to be like a Mark Finley or a Dwight Nelson or a Doug Batchelor or a David Ashrick or a whoever your favorite preacher is, Steve Borg, Peter Gregory, you just go through the list. Or might, maybe it's just your local pastor. What you end up doing is effectively robbing God of the unique contribution that you could make. Does that make sense? You end up robbing God of the unique contribution that you could make. So... In some ways, I, I get nervous about this class on preaching because I feel like we unnecessarily complicate it with too many words and too many ideas and too many strictures and too many principles and too many anecdotes and too many illustrations when fundamentally preaching is exceedingly simple. You have a connection with God through Christ. You are a unique person, totally, fundamentally, substantively different from every other person that's ever been or ever will be. And now you take the unique personality, experience, all of your idiosyncrasies, all of who you are to bear on a subject. And then you proclaim it to those around you. Whether that group is one, two, 20, or 100, you are being the best you that you can be to the glory of God and being faithful to the text of Scripture. Does that make sense, everyone? So that's very easy. Like, I feel like that could almost be the whole class.
But now some of you take a little, you'll need a little bit more than that, a little bit more coaching in terms of, okay, well, I don't know anything about preaching, so give me some basic principles. Everything that we'll say from this point forward will be understood in light of those basic, that, that basic underlying definition of preaching, that preaching is what is true through you. Okay, do we have that, everyone? Preaching is what is true through you. Let's say that together. Preaching is what is true through you. And everything that we'll do up here, that we'll do on the screen, every little, oh, here's a, one, two, three points with an introduction and a transition and an appeal and a closing, everything that we talk about in terms of the use of illustrations and the number of Bible texts and how long a sermon could and should be, all of those things are filtered through. All of those little technicalities are filtered through the very simple definition of preaching. Preaching is what is true through you. Um, just a word on that. Many of you, of course, are more introverted, more quiet, and others are more extroverted and are more verbal communicators. Um, it doesn't mean that if you're introverted that you have to become an extrovert and stand up and be like, brothers and sisters, ah! you don't have to be that. And you can't be that. That's not who you are. But it does mean that in your own skin, right, in your armor, not Saul's armor, in your own skin, you do have to be enthusiastic. Now, your enthusiasm might not look like my enthusiasm. My enthusiasm looks like running around like a wild man, talking at 100 miles an hour, and really trying to get the people's attention. That's what enthusiasm looks like to me. Okay? Your enthusiasm may not look like that, but you cannot, if you're introverted or a little quieter or a little more shy, that doesn't mean that when you stand up, you're not proclaiming the Word of God. You still have to proclaim the Word of God in your unique way, through your personality, in your introverted way or your shy way or whatever it is, you are still proclaiming something. You're telling something. Does that make sense, everyone? And for some of you, that, that balance is going to be tougher to find, tougher to negotiate, tougher to navigate, but you'll pull it off. I have total confidence that through prayer, you will pull this off. And so let's talk about some principles and I think some more um, details will come up as we do that. We're just going to be looking at five areas here, okay? Five areas. And to help you to remember, and in keeping with uh, alliteration, we've, we've sort of formulated them all on the MC here, the MC. And we'll go through them in this uh, order. The first is the messenger's commitment, okay? That's going to be your personal commitment to Christ, and we'll talk about the importance of that. That is the most important thing, the messenger's commitment. Number two is the meaning's correctness. And what we mean by that is, do we have a correct definition of preaching? We've just talked briefly about that here, what preaching is and what preaching is not. So if we're going to be teaching you how to preach effectively, we probably should be agreed uh, on what our definition of preaching is and uh, by extension, of course, what preaching is not. Number three is the message's content. This will be sort of the nitty-gritty. How do you formulate an effective sermon, or maybe I should say a sermon that is... Um, easy to make effective because of its structure. And then uh, fourthly, the master's confirmation. We're going to talk about the role of the Holy Spirit in preaching. You may give all of the data. You may give all of the information. You may say everything in just exactly the right way. But if you do not have the impress of the Spirit, the Apostle Paul says that when we came to you, we did not come to you only with word, but we came to you with word and with power. We came to you with word and with power. Well, what is that power? What is, what is he talking about when he says we came with power? Is it more enthusiasm? Is it talking louder? Is that, what, is that the power that he's talking about? No. It's the, it's the confirmation of the Master. It's the confirmation of the Holy Spirit who takes the preached truth and then stamps it into the individual experience of every person. The individual experience. And only the Holy Spirit can do that. Only the Holy Spirit.